Hello, everyone. I'm David Bottorf, Executive Director of the Association of Indiana Counties, and we have with us today Senator Fatty Fedora. And uh, Fatty's a great ally to local government because he served as a city controller. And it's great for us because he serves on several key committees in the Senate, including the Appropriations Committee. We spent a lot of time in there, in Tax and Fiscal Policy Committee. So uh, he's been a great advocate for local government. We're fortunate to have him with us today. So, with Fatty, thanks for joining. Thank you, David. I'm honored to be here. So, um, again, you were city controller for the city of Indianapolis. How has that helped you at the state house uh, work not only with local government finances as well? At the city level, we were impacted every single day by state laws that regulated what kinds of funds we can use for what purposes. It's regulated, for example, critical formulas, including the gas tax distribution formula, which for counties like Marion County, it's impacted our ability to really uplift our infrastructure to good condition. We're talking about almost $2.7 billion to bring Marion County up to fair condition. And that's only Marion County. If you look across the state, there are other communities that are impacted. When you look at guardian ad litem issues, which are impacted by state funding, when you look at any kind of legislation that deals with tax increment financing or shifting the tax burden uh, from, for example, the business community to local governments and residents of communities. When you look at drainage issues, you look at utilities, all of these issues impact our local units of government. And I firmly believe, as a supporter of local control, that local government is the closest to the people. And if we truly empower local government, then they're going to be more responsive to the needs of our citizens. They can offer higher quality services. Um, so to me, this is a partnership. It makes sense. Um, and while I understand that sometimes the state must regulate policies on a statewide level, uh, I don't see that as a contradictory or that contradicts with the idea that you can work in partnerships with counties and cities. And I appreciate that. And um, we see the way you talk over there and in your votes, your actions over there. Very much. Uh, appreciate that. What are some of your top legislative priorities? There's a lot of talk about taxation this session because we, the state is in a fortunate position to have almost $5 billion of surplus, um, mainly due to the stimulus dollars that we received from the federal government uh, and additional economic activities across the state of Indiana. So while we are in a non-budget session, there's a lot of talk about what can we do with this money. And there were several bills that um, talked about supporting our business community by reducing the uh, personal or business prop personal property taxes. While I support that idea, I want to be mindful of the fact that such reductions could have negative impacts and very serious impact on some counties that are heavily reliant, actually, on large businesses, uh, especially in some of the uh, rural counties. Um, so we want to be mindful that whatever we pass, whatever legislation we pass, as long as we're not impacting local government, if there's a revenue replacement at a state level, whether it is you know, retweaking the corporate tax or uh, giving credits on sales tax or state income tax, these are options that I can, we, we, we can explore. But I want to be mindful that for many years, our cities in Indiana, especially after the property tax caps legislation passed, uh, cities like Indianapolis, Indianapolis is large, and I speak about Indianapolis because I served in Indianapolis. But the, 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 the property tax losses due to the caps when I was a city controller ranged anywhere between 55 to $75 million a year. And that's a significant amount of money for a city. Think through the idea of what if we are able to put $75 million every year to repave our street, to add that to the existing budget, um, or to support public safety initiatives or to improve beautification of our city, you know, sidewalks and trails and bridges and all that good stuff. So I want to be mindful that as far as legislation, that whatever we do in terms of as a state, whether it's taxation or some pieces of legislation that uh, created the pancake tip, for example. Um, well, local governments um, engaged in uh, financial transactions that have bond commitments that they have to fulfill. Uh, so when you create the pancake tip, it creates all kinds of issues. So I'm mindful from a fiscal policy to be sure that whatever we do again is that we're protecting local revenues um, and working in collaboration with state government to be sure that our counties are, are protected. I'll, I'll use one final example. You know, for so many years, many of us, Republicans and Democrats, we said we support solar um, and wind 
as uh, a new source, renewable source of energy. That was a big deal last year. The, the reason that that legislation didn't pass last year is because it completely ignored a critical pillar of how state government should work with local government. It was a mandate that did not take the, in, in consideration the nuances and the realities of different counties across the state. This year, that legislation came back with empowering local governments of unit counties to be actually participants and it created it as an option to work with your, with your private developers on renewable sources of energy. So it's a good public policy. We are supportive of renewable energy and there should be no contradiction with working with in partnership with our local government. And that's why I opposed it last year, and that's why the legislation didn't move forward. As you know, it, it was critical to get every vote, and I, I proudly supported our counties. Um, so these are the types of legislation that I deeply care about because I firmly believe that local government, whether at the town level, the city level, or the county level, they are the closest to the people, they interact with people every single day. And if your residents are not happy with you, they will let you know, and you have to be responsive to them. So I view our role as as, as a general assembly uh, is to empower local governments to do the best that they can. I appreciate that. And that's a great example. Well, your district, basically northern Marion County, southern Hamilton, Hamilton County. County. Yep. And uh, you know, solar is not really appropriate for that area because it's sort of built up residential right. development. But even in the rural areas, uh, they still want to maintain that local control. And we're for renewable energy. Well, we just think the locals have to be able to identify the property. Absolutely. Uh, of course, this past summer, we saw that Indiana became home of the largest solar field in the country yes. up in northern Indiana. So we're, we're working on that. And, and uh, we think that the legislation that didn't pass last year, uh, it was a good thing. And this May provision this year, very helpful and we're working. Um, anything specific else you want to talk about as far as, you know, your district, what's anything special happening here in Green Counties? Absolutely. I think the number one priority at this moment in time for my district is really driven by parents and students and educators. Matter of fact, today we will be in the education committee debating a few policies and pieces of legislation that impact our schools. And that has actually a direct lineage or connectivity with what AIC does. Because the theme here is the same, it's local control. I'm in favor of our school boards maintaining local control, being transparent, working collaboratively with parents, ensuring that we are responsive to the needs of our communities. That's why we have local elected officials that we call school board members. So we are dealing with pieces of legislation that are trying to overly regulate the educational field in Indiana, which is very already one of the most regulated industries in the state of Indiana. Um, and the idea here is that what if we invest in our schools, invest in our school boards, and empower them again to do the right thing for their communities, rather than come up come up with these heavy-handed policies that will actually cripple the field, cripple the educational field. It will pu push teachers away from the field. And, and I, I, I understand why, why teachers, educators, parents, and students are very anxious about this legislation. Because if you put it in a larger context, it's anti-local control. That's number one. And then second, it is, uh, unfortunately, some of these ideas are politically driven. And I don't like politically driven policies. I like data-driven policies. I like policies that are actually nonpartisan or bipartisan policies that are truly, they put the citizen at the heart of these policies. And we shouldn't be in the business of micromanaging curriculum when the actual legislation said, you know, you have to adhere to the Department of Education's approved curriculum. So what is the, if, if you're already saying that your local school board must maintain a curriculum um, committee, well, that's local control. Why do you need to establish state legislation to reiterate local control if it already exists? I'm all in favor of supporting local control, but you understand the way the legal structure of the bill is really not intentionally trying to protect local control. It's trying to get away from that by regulating it at a state level. So my district is currently very concerned, extremely concerned about educational policy because it impacts businesses, our economy, our workforce, our students, and there's only $8 billion engaged in this conversation, half of the state budget on an annual basis that deals with our school. That's a great perspective. I know that that bill is received a lot yes. during uh, electric committee hearing uh, this afternoon. So we always like to finish these discussions with a couple of questions, uh, 
or it's fun nature. So what's your favorite Indiana music? Uh, you know, this is a this is a softball question. Michael Jackson um, um, is, is a favorite, and I have to always support our Hoosier musicians. And uh, he left a legacy, um, a global legacy, not only within the United States, um, that inspires so many. Great. What about favorite, sorry, state fair food or cow fair food? food. I, I, I'm a foodie. I like uh, all types of food, but I can tell you, um, I truly love the smell of popcorn. Kettle corn uh, is unbelievably amazing, and that's why I supported Senator Grooms with making popcorn the official snack of the state of Indiana. Uh, but, but kettle corn is the, is the best. And then our final question, uh, do you have a favorite Indiana sport team, college or pro? Well, since you limited me to college or pro, I can give a shout-out to my North Central High School basketball team. Um, but uh, I, I, I like I support college uh, basketball, and I'm really uh, very supportive of our Pacers uh, basketball team. I wish them the best of success. I wish the Colts the best of success. I'm more of a basketball guy than a football guy, but, uh, but I wish both of them the best of success. Good deal. Well, again, we know you're busy, and appreciate you taking time to come over from the state house and visit with us today. So um, anything we can do to help you out, always call on us. And again, you're a great ally for us at the State House. I appreciate your leadership. You have an unbelievably incredible team, and you keep us informed and educated every session. And uh, I look forward to supporting you in, in many years to come. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you.